again, uh, so this is it, the dynamometer run. So it's a nice sunny morning, um, so we're going to get the engine out and get it all prepared. Um, and then we're going to try and find out how much power this thing actually gives. Um, I'm a little bit apprehensive because the last few months has been building up to this point. Um, because really, um, depending what the results of this is, um, it kind of leads on to future projects and um, what we uh, might bother to achieve with that. Okay, we're just waiting for the engine to warm up a bit before the dynamometer run. I'll just take you over the setup of the, uh, the test equipment. So down here, I've taken the drive chain off um, so there's no extra drag um, from the gearbox. And I've attached this device. Um, so this is a break off of a push bike. Um, so that bit's turning with the flywheel. And then the, the actual brake is attached to this lever. And that is pushing onto a set of scales here. Um, the scales measure in pounds. Um, so we've got a lever one foot long. So that is, so it's going to be measuring pounds foot of torque. To measure the RPM, RPM of the engine, we've got this sensor here. Um, and then there's a magnet attached to the flywheel. So when we turn that round, our readout will start reading numbers. And that will give us our revolutions per minute. Uh, and with those two figures, we can work out what the horsepower is. So we've got our sheet here. We apply the brake until we achieve 100 RPM or a steady 100 RPM. And then we measure the weight that is on the scales. Um, and then we be able to work out the, uh, the torque off of that. Or sorry, the horsepower off of that. And then off the horsepower, we can convert that into watts to give the, uh, the metric readout as well. Yep. So the best result at this point was 36 watts. Um, I was a little bit disillusioned at this point. I couldn't quite understand that it wouldn't. It for only 36 watts. I mean, it would. It can run around the railway around my house, but it's only giving out 36 watts. Um, so I was a bit confused, to be fair. Right after two days of um, contemplating um, what had gone wrong with the test, um, we redid our calculations many times. Uh, we cross-referenced it against uh, online calculators, and we were still getting the same result. Um, then we looked into our test setup a little bit. Um, what we realised was um, the vibration uh, of the engine um, and the braking mechanism on the dynamometer, um, the swing arm, um, it was actually hitting the digital scales like that. And the problem is the digital scales couldn't keep up with that rhythm. Um, so what my dad did, he went and got some uh, some scales and we've, uh, we've modified them slightly to, um, to try and use those instead. Here we are set up on another day. So we've actually changed our scales. Um, we were struggling with the digital scales um, because, because it was bouncing around quite a lot. We couldn't really see what it was. So we've gone with, with these analog um, kitchen scales. Um, and what we've actually done is we've adjusted the scales because um, I think they measured up to about five pounds, which is too high for us. So we've changed the spring out for a lighter spring. Um, and now you can see my father here marking the scales at the various points. He's using um, using some weights to calibrate the scales. So hopefully um, we'll better have a better idea of the uh, the torque measurement now. So we're under slight pressure now, uh, 0.1 bar charge press pressure from the compressor down there. So we're just seeing what we got now. Right, success. So after a bit of um, bit more testing, uh, we're now up to 80 watts uh, indicated. Of course, that's quite a rough estimate, really. This, um, I mean, there's lots of vibration and stuff like that, but it certainly gives us a good idea of um, where the engine is. Um, they reckon that this method of dynamometer testing is um, about sort of 15% um, inaccuracy is possible. Uh, probably more with our setup to be fair because it's not, certainly not as good as it could be uh, maybe in the future i'll try and uh, work something out a little bit better with the next engine just to get a bit more of an accurate figure um i will say that it changes very much depending what the state of the fire is uh, and trying to keep on top of the fire so it's at its peak temperature is is quite a hard thing to do really you have to sort of stock it up with fuel um, wait to a point where it just start, stops smoking and is at its hottest and try and test it at that point. Um, but it is tricky.
Uh, right, so up next, um, there's just uh, more information, more temperature testing. Uh, I appreciate not everyone is interested in that, uh, but I thought I'd better put it up in case it's useful to anybody. Um, so here we go. Here we're just measuring the stack temperatures. Um, we've done it with the engine not running and the engine running. It's potentially about 20 degrees less uh, temperature when the engine's running. Uh, that, I imagine that would be because the heat is actually being taken away from the... Um, the flue gases as they're passing through the heat, the hot uh, side heat exchanger. So that's about 77 decibels, 80 decibels, 81, 81 decibels. Right, I'm just going to take some uh, various temperature readings around the place to try and give people an idea of uh, uh, what temperatures things are at at the moment. It's probably looking at it. I mean, we've got the stainless steel just starting to glow slightly. So I don't know what the temperature of uh, glowing stainless is, but I'm sure we can work that out. Right, so the stack temperature is about 268 degrees, 270 degrees, which is pretty good, really. Uh, the hot seal temperature about 180 degrees, so actually not that hot in the grand scale of things. Oh yeah, we got a bit hotter there, 216, but certainly within the limits of silicon. Um, I'm quite happy about this because in this design, it's a bit of a compromised design anyhow to try and keep the engine nice and short. So in a future design where I'm not haven't got that restraint, I can get this this seal this um, diaphragm a much further away from the fire, which is a good thing. Right, I'm just going to start the engine up now and um, I'm going to take some readings along the cold side of the heat exchanger just to see what, what the temperatures end up as. Um, so the cold side temperature of the uh, diaphragm uh, about 30 degrees. So that means the, uh, the cooler is actually working or the cold heat exchanger about 33 degrees there. Well, I'll try and get some readings of the um, the heat exchanger now. It's a bit awkward, but we'll try to do our best. Try not to cut my finger off while I'm doing it. Right, this is actually a bit dangerous, so I'm going to turn the engine off and then quickly take some temperatures. Right, so two inches from the fire, 220. Three inches from the fire. Yep, yeah, so that's not too bad. Um, a nice differential temperature. It's quite interesting to note that the last three inches, the temperature doesn't change a great deal. Um, so I'd imagine there was a huge question mark of whether the uh, the cold heat exchanger is actually too big for this engine. Yeah, so there you go. That's the um, that's the dynamometer testing and temperature testing and other sort of testing type stuff uh, complete. Um, I'm now going to um, remove the dynamometer gear. Um, I'm done with testing with this engine. Um, then I'll probably um, have a little settle down and calm down from the uh, excitement of this project um i'm quite looking forward to using the engine this summer so that's one good thing and uh yeah um i'll probably do another video at some point i'll probably uh, i've got a few bit of tidying up to the locomotive to um to do uh, a few little additions just just probably for cosmetics and to, to make it look a bit nicer um so uh yeah i'll see you again bye bye